Hello, this is Keith Kaiser with another in our series of studies of the book of 1 Samuel. Today we come to 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel 9, and we're actually going to look at 9 and 10 together. Now they look like a lengthy chunk of the Word of God, but actually this is narrative and much of the detail can be dealt with uh, fairly expeditiously. In any case, we look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, and again, I greet my friends from Oxford Bible Chapel in Pennsylvania, as well as anyone else who may be watching. May the Lord bless the reading of the Word of God, and as we examine it, may it be an encouragement to you. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherat, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So by way of introduction, it seems fairly auspicious that this person who we find out is going to become the king of Israel, that he's an excellent candidate for the first king, at least from the standpoint of what appeals to humanity, that people like someone who is impressive looking, someone who is physically imposing. And this fellow fits the bill. He's head and shoulders above the people. And this is really something that throughout First Samuel is kind of a reoccurring motif. In other words, it runs like a, a, a theme through the book of people looking to big men to deliver them. And we've already seen in First Samuel how men who ought to be big men can be very little in their behavior and how they can disappoint. We think about Eli and Hophni and Phinehas and what dismal failures they were and how they didn't lead people in the right ways of God. Or Elkanah, who even was not as strong as he should have been in dealing with the problems in his household, although he did have a certain allegiance to the Lord, and his wife certainly was a tremendously godly woman and very spiritual. And so we look back to Hannah as really being the, the excellent one in that household. Uh, we saw her son, Samuel, the namesake of this book, was a tremendous man, and he truly is a mighty man throughout the book who leads the people in the right ways of the Lord. Saul, although he begins to look impressive and look good, and he has flashes of greatness, we're going to find out overall that he's a disappointment. And this is the case with human beings, that it's not about how good someone looks or how well someone can speak, but really the question is, what is their obedience to the Lord? And we're going to find out that this was his Achilles heel, the issue that really made Saul not achieve greatness and not live up to his potential is that he was someone who was serially disobedient to the Lord. His obedience to the Lord was sporadic and not the regular thing. It was the exception rather than the rule. And we'll find out that that had destructive consequences, not only for his family and him, but also for the nation of Israel at large. Now, he certainly came from good lineage. His father uh, was something of a chieftain among the Benjamites. And yet, we remember from the book of Judges that at this stage in the game, the tribe of Benjamin would not have been a very big tribe compared to the others. It was well, uh, it was nearly, let's say, wiped out in the time of the Judges through civil war that happened in Israel. And even when Saul gets anointed as king, he has this feeling that he's little among the tribes of Judah, or, uh, the tribes of Israel, excuse me, and little among the clans of his father's tribe. And his father's house is not that powerful. So he tends to take a view of himself as sort of inferior and not as mighty. And yet the word here in describing his father here talks about him as being a mighty man of power at the end of verse 1. And Saul is described as a choice and handsome son. So we'll find out the people, when they first meet him, they're very happy with the looks of this king. And they say, oh, thank you, God. That's exactly the sort of king we had in mind. And yet uh, the problem is that the substance is going to be far different, that it's not how someone looks outwardly, as First Samuel 16, 7 will teach us, 
For man looketh upon the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. And we're going to find out the heart was the problem here. Now, it's a bit of a, a red flag at the beginning, or at least a yellow flag, that the first mission that Saul was seen undertaking, he never really accomplishes. And this is really a man who it, it does things in his life rather halfway, which is not a good way to be, especially in the things of God. And it really has to do with donkeys. And the mission is fairly simple. The donkeys are lost. Verse 3 tells us this. And Kish tells his son Saul, please take one of the servants with you. Arise and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Sha'alim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. Now, it's not always a strange thing for God to train people who are going to be in leadership with lesser, more menial tasks. One can think about how Joseph and his brethren, they were involved in, of course, keeping of flocks and herds and so forth. And Joseph, not as much as they, because his father had visions of him doing greater things. Uh, Jacob, of course, was a herdsman, and, and that was the family business, going back to Abraham, the patriarch. We can think about Moses, who kept sheep on the backside of the desert of Midian, and that he learned how to take care of those wayward animals, which stood him in good stead when he undertook the great work of his life, leading the nation of Israel, and particularly the years that he had to lead them in the wilderness. So often taking care of animals and doing these jobs that maybe aren't white collar, they aren't overly um, taxing, mentally speaking, but these are jobs that prepare people by enjoining upon them diligence. In other words, you need to show up every day and take care of these animals. And in this job of searching for these animals, uh, this can be something where he could learn things that would later prepare him for the Lord. Certainly his successor as King David was going to spend time taking care of his father's sheep. Again, not a prestigious job, a dirty job, and he was the youngest in the family and not really much esteemed in Jesse's household. So when the prophet Samuel later comes to visit them in chapter 16, they don't think to call David in. They let him out there with the sheep. And later in chapter 17, when he goes up to check on his brethren, uh, the oldest brother ridicules him and asks him, who, with whom has he left those few sheep in the wilderness? So they didn't esteem that work. And yet, it was the very thing God used to train David to prepare him for victory because in taking care of the sheep, he learned to fight off lions and bears and protect the sheep and rescue the perishing. And that, of course, stood him in good stead in his battle against Goliath. Now, in Saul's case, he doesn't find the donkeys and he wants to give up. We might be somewhat sympathetic, but in this case, the servant is actually more knowing and more spiritual, we might say, than Saul is in verse 6. He said to him, Look now, there's in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass, so let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Now, these weren't days of great spirituality in the land, so we make allowances for the servant kind of hemming and hawing, saying maybe he can show us. You know, it's it's not stellar faith, but it is faith. And he's saying, look, there's a man of God here. Perhaps we should go inquire of him. Undoubtedly, as a servant, he's also got to be careful with his master's son to suggest, but not to command. He has to remember his place. So verse 7, Saul said to the servant, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there's no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here uh, at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, I may be being a little bit over, over hard on Saul, 
but it seems like he left home without being fully prepared for this trip. He didn't take any money with him and didn't take enough provisions for the journey. He's coming up short, but the servant sort of saves his bacon, if you'll pardon the expression. He has some money here, and he says, we can give this to the man of God to tell us our way. So verse 9, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. And I don't know if there's great theological difference between the terms prophet and seer, other than the term seer emphasizes that as a workman for God, the seer can foretell things that are yet to happen or can see things that aren't evident to other people. Or the term prophet in scripture seems to emphasize the speaking forth the word of God or even foretelling the future, but it has to do with the spoken word. So these are different aspects of the prophetic work, the seeing what God's truth is and the speaking forth of what God's message is to people. And so that sounded like a good plan. Verse 10, Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Now, at this point, they're kind of flailing around. They can't find the donkeys. Where might we get help? Oh, yeah, the man of God. I mean, if you're really up against it, when all else fails, some people say, then we should pray. <laughs> no, first thing we should do is pray. First thing we should do is seek the Lord, right? The Lord Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So again, not tremendous faith, but at least they were looking to God in this instance through his servant to tell them the way they ought to go. So they go to the city, and from here on out, although they're kind of casting around about what to do, we see the providence of God at work. In other words, God is is ordering their steps. Proverbs says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. And so they go to the hill of the city, and they met some young women there, verse 11, who had come out to go draw water. And it's amazing the number of women you meet at wells in the Bible going out to draw water or to get water for uh, flocks and things like that. And those uh, stories, of course, figure prominently in the tales of Jacob and of, um, of Moses. And still later, the Lord very famously met a woman at the well in Sychar in John chapter 4. So here they run into these women, and they ask the question, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, yes, he is just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came to this city, because there's a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. Now remember that at this stage in the game, the house of God at Shiloh is no more. It's been destroyed after that battle against the Philistines. And things aren't apparently put back together the way they ought to be. And so Samuel's really ministering in a time of spiritual dearth when things are at low ebb. And so there are things that happen here that later in the word of God, God wouldn't condone, like the high places are a stumbling block to Israel. Here, though, God in mercy is permitting this type of ministry. Uh, it isn't idolatry. After all, they're worshiping the true God, and they're worshiping the Lord under his prophet Samuel. So here it carries divine sanction. And verse 13, they say, as soon as you come to the city, you'll find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice afterward those who are invited will eat. Now, certain sacrifices like the peace offering, the people would sit down and eat part of the sacrifice, part of what had been offered on the altar to God. Part would go to the priest, part would go to the offerer, part would be burned on the altar for God. So the picture is of God and man sitting down together to have this meal, the peace offering, okay? And these people here are going to do that sort of thing, but it's interesting how the narrative tells us that they are to wait for the prophet to come. Now, that's what we call in literary terms foreshadowing, because really the thing that's going to get Saul in trouble is that Samuel tells him to wait at a later juncture, to wait till Samuel comes, 
and offers the sacrifice, and then they can do the battle against the Philistines. Now that had worked before. You remember the great victory in chapter 7 at Ebenezer, that the people said, cry out to the Lord, cease not to cry to the Lord for us, that he may save us. And yet Saul's not paying attention. Even things here that God's doing, that if Saul has eyes to see and ears to hear, he's learning lessons from God. Wait for God's timing. Do it in God's way. Do it according to the order that God ordains. It's not the end justifies the means. It's not whatever works, practically speaking. It's do it the way God outlines it. And so they went up to the city, and they were coming into the city. There was Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. So notice the timing here, that they just happen to get to the city on the day when Samuel's coming. And it's a day when there's going to be a sacrifice. And they just happen to be entering the city when Samuel is. Again, this isn't happenstance. This is not coincidence. This is God ordering their steps. They're going to meet the prophet, and he's going to uh, lead them into greater truth. Now, verse 15, the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may serve, that he may, excuse me, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. Now, the wording here is reminiscent of the early chapters of Exodus, when we read about the Israelites crying unto God and him hearing their cry. And what did God do? God raised up a deliverer, Moses, who led the people out of the land and through the wilderness, and then through Joshua, he led them into the land. And here, God says, I've heard their cry. I know about my people's oppression. And again, it's wonderful to know that the Lord has his eyes on us, that the Lord omnisciently knows what's going on in the world. In other words, he knows all things, and he knows particularly what happens to his people, and he knows what they suffer, and he hears our cry. So people say, you know, where was God at 9-11, or where was God when this or that catastrophe happened? God hears his people's cry. He's particularly attentive to believers, but he knows everything that's going on in the world, of course, and he's determined to bring deliverance. He's going to save them from the Philistines, and that's going to be a work that he wants to use Saul for. Now, interestingly, he tells Samuel that he's going to anoint him to be commander over his people, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. In actual fact, although Saul does have some victories, like in chapter 14, over the Philistines, he never achieves complete victory over them. As a matter of fact, he dies at the end of the book in chapter 31. His sons and he are killed in battle against the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. So he's never able to close the deal. He's never able to give complete victory. Complete victory awaits the reign of his successor, David. And why? Why is it that he can't deliver the people from the hand of the Philistines? Ultimately, it's because he's not obedient himself. He's the man who does it his way. He's the man who doesn't listen to the Lord, uh, consistently at least. And so he can never bring the people to full victory. Now, Samuel, verse 17, when he saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where is the seer's house. So they don't recognize who Samuel is. However, the Lord's informing Samuel, so he knows who they are. And it's a wonderful little picture of someone walking with the Lord, how they become uh, wiser than people around them, how they know the times, they know what's going on around them. And they might seem like people that wouldn't know what's going on, but because they walk with the Lord, they study God's word. God shows them how they ought to live and act and even speak in certain situations. And certainly it was the case with the prophet Samuel. But Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place. 
for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. So it's a bit like when the Lord sends the disciples to find the upper room that is already furnished to eat the Passover, that the Lord has already prepared everything for them. They don't need to do anything but enter into what God has already set forth for them. And in much the same way, the table is already set for Saul. The meal is already prepared. We'll find out the portion is already there for him. And the Lord is going before him, opening the right doors. But I like this little touch in verse 20. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? So don't worry about the donkeys, Saul. They've been found. Uh, but then he gives them this word of commendation that Israel needs a man like him. And his response, at least at this stage in the game, is humble. And I wish that he had stayed that way in a certain way uh, throughout his reign. Verse 21, Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? So Saul was a physically large man, an imposing man, taller than the other people. And yet at this stage, he says, you know, I, I'm a nobody. I'm not important. I'm somebody who really is insignificant in the nation by comparison with others. And that's just the sort of person God wants to use. He wants to take those who are little in their eyes. In fact, he intentionally chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the things that are weak to confound the mighty. And this is exactly what he's going to do later with David. Now, would to God that Saul always was little, but the problem was he got too big for his royal britches, and that brought in the problem. He got self-confident, and again, he's going to live a life of disobedience. Now, verse 22, Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons, and Saul said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Here it is, what was kept back, and it was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time has been kept for you, since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And in a way, this is a little lesson for Saul that God can provide. You think about Hophni and Phinehas earlier. The last time we saw someone eating sacrificial meals was in chapter 2. And Hophni and Phinehas are taking portions that aren't theirs or portions that aren't sufficiently prepared for them. And they're robbing God by taking of his sacrifices. But you know, if you give God his proper place, God will supply what you need especially spiritually speaking. Believers in our age are said by the book of Ephesians chapter 1 to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Let me take a drink for a moment. Excuse me. Verse 25. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early. And it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. And they were, as they were going out to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on, But you stand here a while, that I may announce to you the word of God. And then we see there's a chapter break, but the thought flow continues because Samuel is now going to anoint Saul for the kingdom. In other words, when someone was marked out for the job of king or the job of priest or the job of prophet in the Bible, they were anointed with oil. And this is why Jesus is called the Christ or Hamashiach, the Messiah. It is the anointed one. 
He is the one who is marked out by God for a special purpose, a special job, if you will. And the Lord Jesus is prophet and priest and king. Here, Saul is going to be anointed as king. And so Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Again, the wording is significant. The Lord has anointed you. He's choosing you for this job, marking you out for it. You're going to be the commander over his inheritance. This is the Lord's people, the Lord's nation, the Lord's things. If only Saul had continued to remember it is the Lord's. That's something that David, his successor, always remembers. And he, by the way, never would lay his hand on Saul, never would hurt Saul, because he said he is the Lord's anointed. So David understood the Lord called this man. The Lord marked this man out. The Lord can get rid of him how and when he wants. I'm not going to do it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. David would have believed in that scripture. And so this is very important, the anointing of the Lord. And he says, verse 2, When you have departed from me today, you'll find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. And there three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. Now, just let me pause a moment and say, notice how biblical prophecy is. It is specific. It is detailed. Some people like to point to other soothsayers and mediums and people that can supposedly tell the future. But it's interesting how vague their prophecies are. And even ones that seem to get it right, don't get it right 100% of the time. And yet biblical prophecy, the standard of a biblical prophet, is that he was right 100% of the time. If what he said didn't come to pass, the Lord said in Deuteronomy, then you know this is not a prophet, I've not sent him. And there were great penalties against false prophecy. That was a capital offense. Uh, you'd get a death penalty for falsely prophesying in the name of the Lord. Now notice, there's a lot of detail here. You're going to go to this place, to Rachel's tomb initially, later to Tabor. You're going to find these men with this specific number of things, three goats and three loaves of bread and the skin of wine. And they're going to give you two loaves of bread. So he's giving him very specific prophetic instruction how to see that God's hand is in this all. How do we know this isn't coincidence? How do we know Samuel's not making this up? Because he's giving Saul all these faith-building signs, all these things to know that this is the hand of God, that there are divine fingerprints all over this. And so verse 5, after that, you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. Isn't that interesting? The place called the Hill of God, and yet the times were such that the enemy was dwelling there, the Philistine garrison. Well, God can work even where the enemy is. We think about how uh, the seven churches are told about Pergamum, and that city was told how that was where Satan's throne was. And so some people theorize why that may have been, but the point is that where the devil is working, it doesn't preclude God from coming in and doing a work as well, because he is mightier than the devil. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Now, we go on and he says, it will happen when you've come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine and a flute and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. What a wonderful statement that is. I believe it's over 
200 times in the Old Testament that God says he is with someone. He is with his people in particular. And of course, we have it in the New Testament as well. The Lord Jesus would be called God with us, Emmanuel. And we read in Romans 8 how he says God is for us and how the Lord Jesus, again, it says of him in Hebrews 13, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Or how he said to the disciples at the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. So this wonderful truth that God is with us, not in the generic sense that God is everywhere in the universe, that's true, but in the specific sense that God personally is attending us, is for us, is on our side, is working through us. And, and that would give him great confidence as he entered in on the work of kingship. Also, the Spirit coming upon him here and giving this sign of prophecy, we can't say that God said, well, as we found out in chapter 8, the people asked for the king. It wasn't God's first choice for them. They would eventually have a king in God's plan, but God wanted it to be the man that he chose. And yet they demanded a king because they said they wanted to be like the nation. So they asked for a king for all the wrong reasons. But that being said, even though God didn't want them to have the king, even though that's not his best at this time, no one could accuse God of not picking a man and not equipping a man who could do the job if he so chose. God's laying it all before Saul and he's giving him the tools he needs to succeed. So it's not as if he picked a, a person who's a bum and put him in office and said, now uh, do your best shot at it. You know, God equips him and God is trying to teach him. And he says, verse eight, you shall go down before me to Gilgal, which was a place rich in their history. It was the place where the generation of the conquest renewed the covenant with the Lord and were circumcised again. And, and that whole picture of cutting off the flesh. In other words, we're not going to depend in human effort. We're not going to be independent of God. He says, surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned his back from going, sorry, had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. And then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets. Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? And therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. So now there's the beginning of marking out Saul for a different kind of work, for something that is not like what has gone before, that he's now a different guy, empowered by the Spirit of God to do this great work. By the way, the Spirit of God came upon people in the Old Testament and also left people in the Old Testament. So it wasn't just a regenerate person who received the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we know that's part of the gospel, that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, Romans 8, 9 says, he who does not have the Spirit of God is none of his. So it's a package deal. You receive Christ, you get the Father and the Son and the Spirit thrown in. They're all together. That He says in John 14, my Father and I will come and make our abode in the believer. They do that, of course, by that Holy Spirit whom he has sent. So when someone believes, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells them. As the Lord said in John 14, he said, you know him because he has been with you and he shall be in you. So the disciples knew what it was to have the spirit come upon them and empower them as they went forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom. When the Lord sent them out two by two, the 12, and later when he sent out the 70, two by two, they had seen and even participated in the work of the spirit. But the Spirit now was going to indwell them. 
And that is something he only does for vessels that have been cleaned by the Lord. In other words, only those who have been redeemed, only those who have been brought to Christ receive the Spirit of God in our days today. But Saul uh, was one who the Spirit came upon him and empowered him for this work, and he was different. So then comes this question with his uncle. Uh, verse 14, his uncle asked him, where did you go? And he said, to look for the donkeys. When he saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter, about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. So there was this sort of keeping the matter under wraps until it was God's plan. And so uh, it wasn't until Samuel calls the people in verse 17, he called them to the Lord at Mitzpah, again, a place in their history where we've already seen them gathered together at Mitzpah earlier in chapter 7. Again, they're called here. And he says to the children of Israel, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, no, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Now, God through Samuel is going to remind them afresh, you're doing a foolish thing. You're demanding a king because you think this is a better way to get what you need. This is a better way to achieve security and to achieve deliverance. But remember, God has a proven track record. 100% of the time, God was able to defeat your enemies and to deliver you even from great superpowers like Egypt, the mightiest nation in the world then. And God brought that nation to their knees and delivered Israel. Why do you think you can do it better than God? And indeed, we might ask ourselves today, when it comes to the church, why do we look to business gurus? Why do we look to the world's entertainers? Why do we try to learn from all these worldly things and say, we need to baptize that and make it Christian and apply that genre of music or that type of speaking or that kind of presentation or even that kind of architecture for the point of doing God's work and building the church. No, what we need is dependence on God. What we need is to preach the word. What we need is to get back to the gospel that talks about sin and hell, but also the grace of God in Christ, how he went to the cross. And if we're going to be saved, we need to repent and believe in him. There's no savior but the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not going to save ourselves or do the work of God with our own methodology and our own wisdom. So again, the Israelites are being reminded, you're doing a foolish thing, but now God's going to give you what you want. But just remember, it's not because God left you down. It's not because he failed. God never fails, and he never shall fail. And so this is because you've asked for it, so gather together. Verse 20, And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul the son of Kish was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. Now I kind of wonder how many suitcases one would have to stack up to obscure a man who was head and shoulders above the people. Not being a tall fellow myself, I have no idea how difficult that must have been. But again, it shows us that Saul at this juncture is not the overconfident, brash, arrogant, putting himself forward type of person. Later, he would kind of develop into that. Unfortunately, he would grow into that role. And it wasn't progress, of course. It was actually uh, becoming less of what God intended him to be. But the Lord knew where he was. The Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, 
Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? And there's no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. So I guess they liked it, right? That's a pretty positive response. They're very happy. But look at verse 25. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it before the Lord. So you remember what he said back in chapter 8, how the king is going to draft your young men and put them in his military and make them his servants and take a tenth of your crop and take your daughters and make them perfumers and bakers and so forth and so on. He rehearsed that again to the people, and now it's written down. It's in the fine print, as it were, and it's laid up before the Lord, just like they had the Ten Commandments laid up before the Lord. They have the word of the Lord laid up here about what the king is going to be like. And that didn't deter the people. They were quite happy. But Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose heart gods had touched. So already there's kind of a posse, as we'd call it today, that are gathered around him. I don't mean those guys that are deputized by the sheriff to go get a bad guy. I mean, he has an entourage. He has certain brave, courageous fellows that see, yes, this man's been raised up by God, and we want to work with him. We want to serve him in this kingdom. God touched their hearts. And it's a wonderful thing when servants are raised up by God to do the work he wants them to do. This is what he always did in the time of the judges. When people were needed for God, God raised them up. And it's the same with the gifts to the church. When we need them, we can cry out to the head of the church and say, Lord, we need evangelists. We need teachers. We need pastors. We need those who will serve. We need those who will be hospitable and so forth and so on. We can go right down through what the church needs and we can ask the Lord to give it. And the Lord has not failed. He continues to send forth laborers into his harvest fields uh, because the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Now, these men went with him, but there was also opposition, verse 27. So those of you who are in leadership, those who might be overseers among God's people, don't fret. If not everybody agrees with you, and there are actually people that dislike you and oppose you, it's a very old problem. Even leaders that God raised up, which although the people were crying out for what God didn't want to give them, God said, I will give it to them, and God did choose this king. So by rebelling, they were rebelling against the God-ordained authority. Look at Romans 13. The powers that be are ordained of God. And if you're rebelling against the authority, you're rebelling against God, therefore. So it's the same way. These rebels, they said, how can this man save us? They were unimpressed. So they despised him. They gave him no honor, in other words, and brought him no presence, but he held his peace. So on that day, he showed some restraint and self-control. And we'll actually see him deal with these men again at the end of the next chapter, chapter 11. So, so far we see God giving the people what they've asked for. They now have their king, and it won't be long before there's a battle. There's an enemy that's arisen, the Ammonites, and they are threatening the people of God. And so Saul is going to have to prove really what he's worth and what he can do. And because he relies on the Lord in chapter 11, there's a victory. So initially, it seems like the people's plan works, but we're going to find out long term that it really doesn't work as well as they thought, and that they would have been much better off to wait on the Lord for the man of his choosing for the time when he wanted to give them a specific king. And thanks be to God, the next king that we're looking for from God is the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will never disappoint. He will put all enemies under God's feet that he might deliver up the kingdom to God his Father so that God may be all in all. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. And we look forward to that. And we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. May God bless you today as you think of that coming. Thank you for listening.